Up next, we have Justin Walker from Jet.com. He's going to talk about Nomad and proxying with console template and Nginx. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. So, I am about to uh, talk to you about Nomad Auto Proxy with console, console template. Now, um, what I mean by Nomad Auto Proxy is essentially, um, you know, uh, Alex gave a great talk about how your jobs actually get you know, on Nomad, get scheduled, they get running. Um, but what happens when you have, you know, tons of different instances that can move around your infrastructure at will when nodes go offline, and you actually want to be able to reach them, uh, especially web APIs, in particular HTTP APIs. Um, but first, a little bit about me. I'm a senior software engineer at Jet.com, uh, and so can you be. Uh, if you want to go to Jet.com careers, you're more than welcome to. You can work with me on all these cool things. We use console, we use Vault, Nomad, Packer, um, and we write Golang quite a lot. So if you like HashiCorp tools and you like writing Golang, I urge you to sign up. Oops. All right. So we're going to talk about Nomad in production. Uh, so we have about 300 jobs in our production system. And uh, that translates to roughly 40 Nomad agents. Uh, that doesn't really even count the fact that we have several you know, QA and dev environments. Um, and we at Jet focus heavily on a microservice architecture which means um, all of our development teams write very, very small services. Their services get scheduled. Um, they do one job, usually read something off a queue, write something back to a queue, read something off a database, write something to another database, uh, communicate with external APIs, with vendors, uh, and so forth. Um, so we have hundreds of these little microservices, and Nomad just freaking works. I mean, we can throw pretty much anything at Nomad, and it will schedule it, and we've had Major network partitions and outages in, you know, in a cloud environment, which are somewhat common, and Nomad has just continued to operate, and we haven't really had to worry about it so much. But um, for both historical reasons and also because we just like Nginx, um, we use Nginx to route all of our HTTP traffic. Now, the one thing about Nginx, if, uh, those of you know, uh, Nginx configs are relatively static. You are supposed to write them maybe once, uh, you configure you know, your upstreams in the server block. Uh, you, you, know, you configure all your proxy pass options, all those HTTP header stuff. Um, and this is usually done you know, once. You probably you know, modify it a few times. You bring up a new server. But that's, that's the old way. I mean, that's from the days where you had like, maybe one or two servers serving your website. And you had Nginx to proxy between them. You know, and they're pretty big servers, so it was just for load balancing purposes. But that's not what Nomad is, 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 uh, is designed for. We want, we, want to have many, you know, we want to have many instances that can seamlessly transition from different parts of our infrastructure um, to respond to failures. Um, we also have many, many APIs. I mean, uh, our team at Jet, the DevOps team, is relatively small, less than 20 people. We service hundreds of developers, and each developer is responsible for maybe one or two microservices. So we have like many hundreds of microservices. Um, so we need a way to give developers uh, some way to pretty much service them themselves, um, because uh, we don't want to be the bottleneck for any kind of application they want to bring online. We want to be you know as as, you know, as easy to work with as possible. I mean, our job is really to get out of the way and let them take care of themselves. So what we really need is some kind of self-service way to configure uh, our HTTP proxies with near zero configuration. So before you ask, I caution you, before you try to implement any of the things, you know, buyer beware, these things do exist. They are a lot better than what I'm going to tell you to do right now. <laughs> so please, if, if you have the capability to do that, use one of these. Uh, I, I just found out that Fabio was recently acquired by HashiCorp, so Maybe we'll get some integration in Nomad. Who knows? Um, but, um, but yes, definitely use these if you can. Um, if you can't, or if you have to use something like HA proxy, this, this, some of these um, actually applicable to, to many of those you know, older uh, things that are not Nginx. But this is talk is specifically about Nginx. Um, so the examples that you'll see are mostly about that. All right. So how do we do it? So we pretty much interact with Nomad. You know regular way. We uh, run an upstream HTTP server wherever. They submit a job. Um, in your job file, you have a service definition. That service definition tells uh, console uh, what your service is named, uh, what ports your service advertises, um, and also tags so that we can locate that service. Um, and it also adds health checks so we know, you know maybe your API is technically running, 
but can it actually respond to HTTP requests? Um, so console gets all of these services in aggregate. Um, it lists all of these in the service discovery backend, and it monitors the, the health of the, of, the, of the services. And then we have a console template on our Nginx nodes that monitors all of the console services for changes. Uh, and whenever those service uh, changes, they create an upstream config, create a server, a server definition, and then they'll reload Nginx. And Nginx just does what it does best, serve HTTP, um, not much to talk about. Uh, all right, so prerequisites for this setup. Um, you need a wildcard DNS, and if you want security, you need a wildcard uh, cert. And the way that you get a wildcard cert is you hand your CA a bunch of money, <laughs> and then they, after some length of time, give you back a certificate, and there really is no two ways about it. Um, it's expensive, I'm sorry, I don't control the CAs. Um, if you don't need HTTPS, I would caution you against not having it, but, um, but yeah, if you want to do it this way, definitely. So my, my example here is we're going to have a, you know, a star cn nomad.nginx.example.com. I'm going to be using that example throughout the slides um, just to keep for the consistency. Um, you'll typically get back for your wildcard certificate something like this with a CN and, and SANS. And then here's what your Nomad job file might look like. So as I mentioned, um, you'll run your task. You'll have a service definition in your task block. Uh, that task, what we do is we have a special tag for our Nginx proxies that says, um, this service actually wants to be proxied behind the nomad.nginx.example.com proxy. Um, and it will advertise its HTTP port, whatever that might be. So Nomad will dynamically assign uh, an HTTP port to this process. Uh, it will be available through uh, you know, an exported environment variable. The application will read that, and it will uh, list on that port. Or if you're on Docker containers, that port mapping might be done for you. Um, and it's also critically important to have health checks, because um, if you don't have a health check, your service is assumed to be healthy, and that's not always the case, especially at startup. So you'll definitely want to also add a health check. Uh, and you can kind of see there, I color coded it so the port that you put in your service matches the network port that you've assigned in your resources block. I've abridged this. You could probably actually run this against, um, well, it needs an artifact, but you can almost run this against the, the Nomad job verbatim. All right, so here we're going to get into the actual nitty gritty. So we're going to take a look at the actual console template configuration for Nginx. Uh, so the first thing we want to do in our Nginx uh, console template config is we want to be able to iterate all of our all of our services. So, but we only really want to put the services behind our Nginx which asked for it. So we need some way to filter out which services want to be on this proxy. So the way that that's done is we just filter out if, it, if the tag is contained in that service definition. It's really straightforward. We just create a nomad upstream after the name. We iterate all over each of the services. So the, actually the range service is kind of a stub. You need a little bit more uh, information in order to actually get the address and port. So that's why that range of service lookup has to happen later. Um, so you'll just add your server blocks there, address colon port. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail of what you put in the, the server block uh, in the next slide. And um, it's not that bad. I mean, obviously, you have to get your wildcard cert to the Nginx somehow. But once you do that, it's pretty much a matter of uh, putting your server name in front of that wildcard, and this is what, why you need that wildcard DNS, because your wildcard DNS will be pointed to these Nginx servers. And um, based on the you know, vhost, essentially, the, the name of the console service that you've registered, it will map it to the correct server block and will serve the, from the correct upstreams. Um, and all the rest is, is kind of just you know, fluff. I, I, I condensed it down so it was only the stuff you need. And that's it, really. I mean, this is like probably the shortest talk you've had at this conference, right? I mean, seriously, it can be that much more simple, right? So thank you, everybody. That's it. I'm off. Oh, but there's a problem with this. The problem is that we didn't really account for disasters. What kind of disasters can we get? Well, somebody, we want our developers to have you know, unlimited access to this, these definitions. So we want them to be able to put whatever they want. But the problem is they can't put whatever they want. For instance, if they forget to advertise a port, zero is not a valid port. Console will gladly give you zero as a port. Nginx will gladly accept port and then fail to reload. And when Nginx fails reload, we are sad. 
Similarly, if there are no healthy upstreams, I mean, perhaps all the upstreams came up, but there's a code problem, and, um, and you know, we need a little, uh, another redeploy to, to solve it, or perhaps they didn't even deploy it at all. I don't know. Uh, in any case, if there are no upstreams in a server block, that's a failure. Nginx failures are bad. Um, what they effectively mean is that whatever the state Nginx had before is the state it continues to have. And that's good. That's good for a static config. It's not very good for a config where servers can be changing underneath you. Um, and Nomad jobs move around all the time. We are constantly scaling up our platform up and down. Uh, and we, we can't really even cope with, uh, with a frozen config for very long. We have to do something about it. Um, so it's, we, it's imperative that we safeguard our, our uh, console template configs by doing a little bit more work and uh, making them a bit more robust against these kinds of failures. So here's an example of a fail-safe config. So one of the first things you'll notice is that I'll just check to see if your port is greater than zero. Um, if that, that, that's just true that console will give you a zero port if you haven't advertised one. So you can just really just check for, for the port being uh, greater than zero, and you won't put the server block in. That'll get you one, plate, one, uh, one point, but not all of them. You see down there, there's a server, uh, localhost, colon nine. That's really just a placeholder. Um, what it does is if there are no servers at all, at the very least, there'll be one static server that won't serve any traffic, and you'll get 502s, which are a lot better than having your Nginx config frozen and potentially not routing to the correct upstreams that you want it to route to. So there's an improvement we can make on this. Uh, console template, or console rather, has this cool uh, capability where uh, console can have multi-data center uh, discovery. What you can effectively do with this is you can have two Nomad clusters, and those nomad clusters can service uh, a primary region and a secondary region. And you can use Nginx as a kind of a transparent backup between them. Um, so what you want to do is you want to you know, basically have an identical configuration in both of your, uh, both your data centers. You want to bridge the two console templates or console services together um, under a WAN link. And then just alter your config a little bit in order to uh, make it back up to those servers if it needs to. And this is kind of what you do. So what you're going to be doing is ranging through your primary data center, doing the exact same thing that we did before, except um, you're also going to range through your secondary data center as well and put them as an Nginx backup. And what that allows you to do, uh, Nginx will prefer the non-backup upstreams, and then if those upstreams don't exist, or if they're unhealthy, or if they, get, you know, if they fail too many attempts, uh, Nginx will automatically start routing to your backups. And that's great. It works wonderfully. But what if the entire service at your data center is undefined? Well, think about it. We have a range over data center one. The entire block, if that service doesn't exist, then that entire block doesn't get defined. So that means that your service is gone. And effectively, you could have all of your services in data center two up and running and available, but if data center one is down, then you don't have any server config, and that's a bad thing. So how do we protect ourselves against that? Um, if this works, all right. So the way we protect ourselves against that is first, we iterate through the backup server, and we only add the services if they are not already in the primary data center. What this allows us to do is um, catch those few servers that like fall through the cracks, and um, and basically uh, those services are not actually in the primary data center. Uh, they'll actually be listed first, and they'll instead of being the backup servers, they'll actually be the uh, the primary servers. So effectively, what console template is doing here is doing a backup backup of your data center. Um, but what if the entire service is undefined? Now, that means that both we don't have the service in data center one or in data center two. And um, well, there's not a lot you can do, really. I mean, what we kind of want to do, uh, like what systems like Fabio do, is um, they're dynamic, so they can kind of handle this. Uh, if your service is undefined, it's a 502, 503, it's some kind of error. Obviously, we need to put some kind of error here. Um, but if we just don't define the server, then what will happen is that Nginx will do something very, very handy for the wrong reason. So what we need is a default server. So 
that I've underlined the point here, if none of the directives have a default server, which I've, I have not put a default server directive in any of them, Nginx will happily just say, okay, what's the first one we got? So may, you might have like two services, you know, one's effectively completely down, uh, and then another one is actually up. And uh, I think it actually does this alphabetically, or it really depends on your config order. Uh, but essentially, you may be going to service A, and um, service A is down, so Nginx will be like, all right, well, service B is up, so why don't you just go to service B? Well, APIs are rarely interchangeable, so you can't just do that, Nginx. What the hell? So we have to at least do something to, to block that. So we need some kind of static, static config. You can return whatever error code you want, 502, 503. But effectively, we need a, a distinct uh, default server for whatever ports we're listening on in order for Nginx to uh, not route to the next available server. And this is kind of a rare case where we don't want it to automatically help us out, because helping us out is actually hurting us quite a bit. And that's really it. I mean, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I had a pleasure, pleasure talking to you.